Hello, everyone. Yes, um, welcome to this second uh, webinar in a series of two, um, which will be about the UCSC Genome Browser. My name is Jeff Christensen from the Emble Australia Bioinformatics Resource, and I'll be your host for today. I have two colleagues uh, that are behind the scenes co-hosting the webinar with me, and that's Susanna Sabine from ARDC, as well as Christina Hall from Emble ABR. EMBL ABR, or the EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource, is a distributed national research infrastructure network and we provide bioinformatics support to life science researchers in Australia. It was set up as a collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability. We currently have 13 nodes across Australia, which are shown here on this map, um, each of which undertake or support bioinformatics research around several key areas. And these are data, tools, compute, standards, platforms, and training. Before we jump into the webinar today, I'll mention a couple of housekeeping things. So all attendees will be in listen only while the speakers are talking, and that's to minimize background noise. If you do have a question, please type it into the question pod in the uh, GoTo uh, software. This broadcast will be recorded and we will make it available on the Emble ABR YouTube channel, and we'll notify you by email when that's available. Today, we're very excited to have Robert Kuhn uh, joining us again to deliver this webinar. Um, Rob, Robert or Bob is the Associate Director of the UCSC Genome Browser. Bob received his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara in biochemistry and molecular biology, where he studied the centromeres of yeast. Following a postdoctoral uh, position at UC Berkeley, USDA Plant Gene Expression Center. He taught biochemistry, molecular biology, and genetics at UC Santa Cruz. He joined the UCSC Genome Browser Project in 2003, where he's now Associate Director with a particular interest in clinical genetics. Today, Bob is also being joined by uh, Lou Nassar at UCSC, who will also be, um, he'll be answering questions directly into the question pod. Today in this webinar, we have 117 people registered and we'll continue to explore the UCS, UCSC Genome Browser and start to look at some of its more advanced features which are listed on this slide. I also just wanted to mention that this is actually a webinar as part of a series and we have an accompanying hands-on workshop. Um, so if you're based in Cairns, Townsville, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne or Adelaide, you can also attend the accompanying three-hour practical workshop on the 8th of November. So that's going to be led by Bob uh, from California over video conferencing, and it'll be facilitated locally by a network of bioinformatics training volunteers. The workshop will cover some practical exercises that have been in dis that, have, that were discussed in today's and yesterday's webinar. So if you are interested in attending, please visit our events page. So that link is shown here at the bottom. So go to the Emble AVR website slash about slash events and there are links to register um, for all of those events. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, hand over to Bob. I'll make you the presenter. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning. And uh, I'm going to start here. There we go. With a uh, Thank you to Jeff and uh, Susanna and Philippa on uh, your side of the uh, the pond uh, for all the organizing and all the fine work, background work they've done to set us up for today. It's my expectation that uh, most of you were here yesterday, and I'm going to continue from, from there, pick up a few things that we missed yesterday. Um, I apologize in advance if I'm uh, working a little fast. The... Uh, uh, the browser is really hard to do in just a couple of hours, or I think we've got a total of two and a half hours, two and a quarter hours these two days. Um, but uh, the purpose is to show you uh, a lot of what the browser can do, and to some extent showing you a little bit about how to uh, how to do it. But the only way to actually become uh, adept at it is to practice, and that's what the practical uh, hands-on part uh, is on uh, November 8th. And uh, uh, the first step in any process, of course, is knowing what the thing can do. And so um, six months from now, if you, you're faced with a task and you go, yeah, I know the browser can do that, and I know right where to find the answer, I'll start with that video. Uh, we have some uh, royalties and a contract with Regeneron that we should disclose. 
Uh, here's once again the acknowledgments, which you saw yesterday. Here's the team. Uh, there's Lou's name uh, right there in the list. I thank Lou for being here today to help with the online uh, uh, chat with the, uh, the question and answer during the, the webinar. Okay, I remind you again that we have a YouTube training channel with uh, 15 videos uh, in it. They, uh, they total maybe uh, an hour and a half if you watched all of them. And we have on-site workshops if the two-hour webinar format doesn't work for you. Um, Give us a call and we'll try to do an in-person workshop. So here are links. Yesterday, uh, I gave you the wrong link on this slide. Uh, the second slide, it will be uh, as a link to a page. Uh, please open up a browser uh, window or a tab uh, to that page and we'll be uh, accessing that content uh, forthwith. Uh, this slide is also uh, on that same page, that index page you get to when you follow the uh, bit.ly, this uh, bit.ly uh, uh, link right there and uh, that's just to give you a little uh, outline of what we hope to accomplish today. Um, this is also a slide that's on that page and it forms the basis for um, uh, showing you how some of the data can be used in a clinical setting where the uh, different databases that are available at UCSC uh, span uh, small variants to large variants in the horizontal direction here and uh, pathogenic versus benign in the, uh, in the vertical dimension. And there's a page called databaselinks.html, uh, which we'll uh, use in a little bit in, in the live portion when I go live to the browser to show you how you can use sessions to set up scenarios for yourself so that you can quickly get to the tracks you're interested in and uh, not have to uh, uh, reconstruct them laboriously through lots of clicks. In fact, we have a new feature coming out on the browser fairly soon, um, engineered by Lou, uh, that will uh, have uh, a number of different scenarios uh, in which you might be interested in having certain data tracks turned on um, for certain purposes. And uh, we'll be announcing that uh, uh, not too, uh, in, not to, in the not too distant future. Um, here's a uh, slide that describes some of our data sets and how uh, the browser is useful uh, in uh, uh, sequencing experiments, in particular uh, if you're sequencing exomes, uh, but also other types of sequencing. So uh, just for display of data, you have uh, BAM files and CRAM files uh, to display the reads that come off of the sequencing experiment. Um, for coverage, you can convert a BAM file to a wiggle file or a big wig, which is simply a, a binary condensed uh, wiggle. Uh, we also I have BAM in uh, parentheses there because we have a mode when you load a BAM file, a uh, BAM file can be converted into a coverage track uh, just to show you the depth of coverage. And I just uh, demonstrated that yesterday. And then finally, to look at the variance, uh, we have uh, PG SNP format, which is a way to get data uh, into a simplified format for variance, which is also uh, uh, raw material for the uh, variant annotation integrator and uh, VCF file, and then HTVS and RS are also uh, input uh, formats for interpreting variants. Uh, on the predictive side, the kinds of things you can predict with uh, your uh, uh, various inputs, variant annotation integrator uh, will output uh, SIFT, polyfen, uh, mutation taster, mutation assessor, and a few other uh, variant predictors. And uh, then we have data tracks, uh, the uh, four quarters of the grid that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, to load your own data, there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, we will work with uh, custom tracks today, show you how to load uh, simple text uh, text files for loading uh, uh, your data. And uh, there are many formats available for that. And custom tracks loads the entire file. You can either copy paste the data or you can uh, use a URL to the data uh, into uh, custom tracks. Uh, track hubs are a little bit more complicated, but they're more flexible. They give you uh, access to much larger data sets they can be loaded via index binary files, or I should say they must be loaded via index binary files. And some of the simpler formats that are used in custom tracks uh, cannot be used in the uh, track hubs unless they're converted, for example, a bed file to a big bed file, which is a, a condensed binary uh, format. Uh, they must be hosted remotely via a URL unless you have a, a copy of the browser downloaded to your desktop 
in which case they can be loaded, they're loaded um, locally because you've downloaded the code uh, next to your uh, data. And uh, Track Hubs dis uh, loads into the browser or uploads. Um, you can upload um, uh, your files um, and it displays only the amount of data. It loads, uploads only the amount of data that uh, are, uh, are used uh, in the display itself rather than uploading the entire uh, track. Um, assembly hubs is a special case of track hubs. Uh, they're used for genomes that we do not host at UCSC, but you can also uh, upload your own two-bit uh, file, which uh, represents the coordinates, and you can upload those into the uh, into the browser, and then you can hang your annotations on that uh, without regard to whether UCSC hosts them or not. Uh, so here's a little cartoon that describes that. Uh, if you upload a custom track, the whole file goes to UCSC. If you upload it via URL, the same thing happens. The whole file goes to UCSC, uh, but it's uh, server to server rather than uh, you copying and pasting the data. And then finally, a, uh, uh, the big format, the big bed, big wig, and other formats allow you to load a very large file onto your server, and only a small amount of the data um, are loaded uh, to our server, only what's needed for display. Uh, down at the bottom here, uh, Cyverse is to remind me to tell you that there's a, uh, a project called Cyverse, as you see it's spelled there, um, that allows um, users to sign up for five gigabytes of data storage. And those five gigabytes then are available uh, for loading directly into UCSC um, via the Track Hub mechanism or via the URL um, uh, format that's shown in the middle panel here. Uh, we know that a lot of our users are um, molecular biologists and don't have either the savvy or the access, one or the other, uh, to get data in easily into an HTTP location where they're uploadable into the browser, and Cyverse is a way around that. Uh, we're also working to make Dropbox uh, handle the, the byte range queries, the type of queries required to uh, load the data into the browser uh, remotely. So if you're loading data via Track Hubs, what happens is uh, you make a request from your machine then UCSC software will go out to the hub, which is some other location, and uh, grab the data from there, uh, bring it back to uh, UCSC, where we can combine it with UCSC's data or your own data if you've loaded uh, your own custom tracks. And then finally, it all gets displayed at UCSC when, uh, uh, when the uh, click has uh, finished executing. Uh, none of that's visible to the user, but it does show you how the browser handles data from uh, multiple sources and combines them into a single image. And in, uh, on a web page browser, this blue area is your desktop and you just see the image. On the genome browser in a box, the software winds up inside your firewall as well. It's inside on your desktop. And so the data are available to you uh, and UCSC data may be downloaded directly to your machine, or it may be uh, input uh, via a, uh, uh, a, a query to UCSC. So the data will come uh, from UCSC on, on demand. And then finally, the remote data can actually be your own data. Uh, if your data are on your uh, server, you can load it into UCSC then without having to uh, uh, expose your data to any uh, prying eyes from the outside world. A reminder uh, that we have two new data uh, types, uh, interactions and bar chart, which I hope to get to at the end. We can load a couple of dummy files, um, not dummy files, but example files uh, to show you how the, uh, um, the bar chart and uh, interactions data sets look on the browser. So this is to remind me that uh, the assembly hub mechanism is available to you. Uh, we have a, a an undergraduate research, not research, an undergraduate uh, teaching lab that's sequencing the banana slug, which is the uh, UCSC sports mascot. I don't know if you guys in Australia do that, where all of your team names, all of your, your schools have uh, lions and tigers and bears and Vikings and uh, Trojans and uh, so forth, Some uh, lots of very aggressive uh, mascots. Uh, UCSC doesn't actually have a football team, uh, although we do have what you guys call football or soccer um, as, a, as a club sport. And so they're actually sequencing our mascot, which is the, uh, an invertebrate. It's a, a mascot in the uh, a little unusual mascot in UCSC style. And there it is in the, uh, with something for scale. You can see how big they get in the woods back here in uh, Santa Cruz. 
Um, the uh, uh, NCBI uh, has a large number of genomes that we haven't gotten to put into the browser, and we haven't gotten to the, uh, uh, to the state of getting them into the browser. But our engineer, Hiram uh, Clausen, downloaded in an automated process the, uh, uh, the entire contents of anything that had a, a gene set um, associated with it, 30,000 animals and plants and bacteria. And you can uh, access it via that link you, that you see right there, the bit.ly link. And that's still in the, uh, uh, the Skunk Works project phase. We're not sure how or if we're going to be releasing it to the, uh, the public site. But if you're working on an animal or a plant that's not part of the UCSC standard setup, you can get to minimal browsers of uh, a variety of kinds from that link. Uh, I can't guarantee that it'll always work because uh, Hiram is uh, tweaking with it from time to time. That's why there's a three on the end of this bit.ly. A couple of times he's moved the uh, moved the hub to a new location and had to change the link. Okay, so at this point, I wish to switch over to the genome browser and go to a live session. So uh, let's start with reset all user settings the way we did yesterday so that we're all starting uh, at the same place. And... Before we go any further, let's go first to uh, my data, my sessions, and log in as uh, uh, with the uh, login that I created for today. So I'll sign out from uh, my own login, and we'll go to login. We'll type in username Australia 2018, and then password genome. And uh, I will not save that login. You can see that there are a few test sessions here that were saved uh, not too long ago. And now you have access to the, uh, the login page where you can save at any point during today's process. If you're interested, you can save any session you like, give it a name. Uh, I only ask that you not uh, overwrite someone else's session. If you try to save the session and it has a name already, then it will... Uh, warn you that you're about to overwrite a session, uh, please don't overwrite someone else's session. Maybe use your own uh, um, sorry, use your own uh, uh, initials or something like that to make uh, your session uh, uh, personal and not uh, overwrite someone else's. So for now, I'll go back to sorry for the noise. I'll go back to the uh, genome browser by clicking the, the link in the upper uh, in the page there. And uh, one other little bit of uh, bookkeeping here. I want to take you to that URL that I gave you in that earlier slide. Uh, I can retype it. I go back here to this slide and whoops to the PowerPoint and simply type it in right here in large, uh, large type. So it's bit.ly without the capital slash UCSCAU 2018. And I'll get rid of the. Uh, the capital B here. Give you a second to catch up and get to that page. So this is that page. And I wish to point out to you these four links here at the bottom of the, of the page. We're not going to use them today, uh, but they are uh, what I usually bring in hard copy when I do a face-to-face -face workshop. These are uh, quick reference cards uh, for the genome browser and the table browser. And something that you can have, you can print out for yourself and have it as a, a bit of a cheat sheet for uh, when you're using the browser, trying to figure out where things are. They were made for us by a company called uh, Open Helix, uh, who uh, they do some bioinformatics trainings. Okay, so flipping back to the browser now, here we are at the default page. And let's just start with hide all. We'll start with a, a clean session. And We'll start right in on loading uh, custom tracks. Oh, we wound up at HD38. So this is as good a time as any to show you uh, navigating back and forth between HD38 and HD19. So you can see here that on HD38, we have our default track for uh, UCSC uh, for, the, for the gene set uh, is uh, the gen code uh, set, which is uh, curated in the UK uh, at EBI. So we'll set that to pack and hit refresh. 
Uh, other organisms have um, different names for the first, uh, for the main gene set, but will always be the first uh, item in the, uh, the blue bar group that is genes and gene predictions. So here we've turned on the default track uh, to the default location, the mTOR gene. And I want to show you something about using these uh, pull downs here in the menu. Uh, there's a, the, the most recent two assemblies in human and the most recent two assemblies in mouse are up here in this menu. And they will jump you back and forth easily from one to the other. Um, but there's a uh, something that you ought to know about going back and forth between the two genomes because there's, there's actually two ways to do that. So for example, if we go over here to view in other genomes, the genome browser will use um, the homology between the two uh, re reference assemblies, uh, HG38 and HG19. Uh, you can also use the same link to jump from human to mouse or to any of the other genome assemblies that we have. And you can jump to uh, HG19 very easily and when you submit that, you will be at that same um, location, although the coordinates will be different in HG19. Uh, so if we click on that, we, want, we should wind up at the mTOR gene in uh, HG19. So the browser shows us just a few tracks, and it just depends on which tracks you had turned on over at the other, um, uh, the other genome assembly uh, earlier. So let's say, for example, we type in another gene name up here. We type in NF1 uh, in the position box and then hit the go button. We navigate to uh, HG19's NF1 gene and one of the isoforms, the, uh, the, uh, the canonical isoform is highlighted there in uh, reverse video. It's white on black. Okay, so here's where I can show you the difference. If we go back here to view in other genomes, it will find the NF1 gene on HG38 using uh, homology, using our kind of complicated pipeline to figure out the best match between any sequence in one organism uh, or assembly and another sequence in the, uh, uh, the same sequence in another assembly. However, over here, if we use genomes, the browser remembers where we were on uh, eight, last time we were on HG38 and so it'll jump back to uh, the mTOR gene. So that way you can go to another uh, genome, you can jump around, look around in HG19, HG38, and uh, get your, uh, uh, have two different ways to get back. If you browse around in the other location, you can back, get back to where you were when you left. So let's go to HG19 again, because that's still the genome that's best annotated. And in fact, two thirds of our traffic on uh, human genome assemblies uh, is still on HG19. So I want to use um, one of the pages now from uh, that other page where the other URL there, and it's the database links.html page here. Here is the third uh, link down. And if we click on that, you see that we have a, a, an image that uh, is the same image that was the slide I showed you earlier, but above it is four uh, boxes that represent links that will take you to those locations in the browser. So for example, if you're interested in pathogenic data sets that are of small size, this lower left cord, uh, quadrant is the uh, location you want to use. And so if I click on the small pathogenic uh, link there, it will open up a browser page that has data sets that are relevant for uh, small pathogenic. Okay, so Leiden has actually in recent years taken to having somewhat larger um, uh, variants in their database. But in general, these data sets then, uh, for example, ClinVar here, you can see there are a number of ClinVar variants um, in the track. So um, these tracks are all set to dense uh, visibility. So all of the uh, visibilities uh, on the browser, each track has its own set of visibilities. And um, some of them are more useful in dense and some are more useful in uh, pack or, or, uh, or full. Uh, so the short answer to what do those things mean is you should just try them all and see what you like for the different tracks. A, uh, a track such as ClinVar here um, will have labels next to them, but you might be only interested in knowing where the variants are, what's the arrangement of variants. So that's why this one is in dense. 
using my right mouse button here, I can switch it from dense to pack, which will put a label next to each item and distribute the, uh, uh, the individual items on the, uh, uh, the browser screen here. And it will show you that, uh, what your variants are. So this is a C to T change, uh, as well as the prediction that it's likely benign and uh, that uh, it has one star, which is the ACMG, or maybe it's not ACMG. I think it's the, Clin, uh, the ClinGen or ClinVar um, representation of how confident uh, they are uh, of that uh, representation. You can see here that there's a deletion here of a GTAC and so forth. So it gives you a little bit more information. And that's true of all of our tracks that are in uh, a typical bed format that allows you to see the, uh, the label. Uh, whereas uh, under dense, you might be interested just in seeing where the uh, annotations are uh, rather than caring about, uh, caring about the label. So I'll leave the other three quadrants of that uh, representation on the other page uh, to you to click around in. And you can see that each one of them uh, will load data sets that are relevant for the particular quadrant that's uh, uh, represented there. So if I jump back to that uh, link and go back to uh, the index, I want to show you here the ACMG guidelines that are being followed in laboratories uh, around the world for clinical genetics uh, uh, diagnosis. And uh, if you scroll down to the first uh, table in this paper, you see that there are recommendations here for a lot of different uh, uh, data sets for doing an analysis of a, a sequencing experiment from uh, individuals. Um, with one exception, every one of these databases, we have Exac on the genome browser. We have the Thousand Genomes Project as a data set on the genome browser. Uh, we have dbvar, we have uh, dbsnp, we have uh, clinvar, we have omen, and so forth. So one of the powerful aspects of the browser is the way uh, it brings together data sets from all over the world and all kinds of different uh, projects into one location. So you can see directly on the browser all of these things side by side. And we make it very easy then for you to click back to the original record in the uh, original data set so you can read the details. And I showed yesterday a record from OMIM. So you can see uh, that we give you a tick mark on the browser. We give you a small amount of data when you click into the item on the browser, but then we give you a link back to OMIM, which gives you the, uh, uh, the richness of the entire data set uh, available to you. You can see everything that they've got. So, whoops, I don't want to crash that window. I want to go back one now so that I'm back at that index and I can use it again. And now I'll flip back to the, uh, to the genome browser. I mentioned earlier and uh, mentioned yesterday also that we have available a download of the genome browser. I want to show you quickly where it is if you're interested in having a, a local copy on your machine. And uh, it's uh, available through the genome browser store, which is a little bit of a misnomer because most of our users are uh, working at academic institutions or government uh, laboratories and so forth. And if you scroll down the page here, you find that the cost for nonprofit academic research use is free so that you're not uh, going to have a, uh, a charge to you unless you're at a profit making company. So I'll use the back button now to get back to the, uh, to the genome browser. So I want to jump now into one of our uh, most interesting and uh, exciting features, uh, the browser and it's uh, what I call we, we call Exxon only or Exxon mostly mode uh, Exxon mostly in the sense that you can put a little padding around the exons on the display and uh, so you can see a little bit of the adjacent intron if you're interested if you uh, do a whole exome sequencing um, your exon capture array will often capture some fragments of DNA that extend into the intron and you may be interested in seeing uh, your coverage over there as well in the intron so you may want to uh, be able to, you want to pad your, uh, your exons a little bit in the display. So let's go to my data, my sessions, and we'll load a session here to uh, see that uh, uh, we'll all start on the same location. So I see none of you has, oh, someone has, here's one that was saved today, ACE HG19, a new session was saved. Okay, so let's go to restore settings. We'll start with uh, username example, and we'll go to hg19 underscore 
exons and load that. So HD19 underscore exons, here it is again for you for a few seconds. And then I'll click to the browser page here to the, using the browser link, it jumps back to the genome browser. And this display then shows you uh, 17 data sets. So there's the gene set at the top. You can see we're at uh, 2.1 megabases of DNA. And the data sets here are represented in sets of four, which are uh, in each color, uh, each set of four is a, uh, uh, a cell line. And each pair within that set of four uh, is a replicate aligned to one strand or the other. Uh, these data come from a much larger data set that's part of the, uh, uh, the ENCODE project on HG19, for which we were the uh, data uh, coordination center. And if you click this little button on the left side here, this configuration button, you can see all the other data sets that are there. I'm not going to do that. There are uh, dozens of them. And you can see that this particular gene here, the ATP11C uh, gene, is uh, expressed in all four cell lines, uh, pretty much the same in each. You've got a number of other uh, genes. Uh, at this resolution, exons and individual small genes are very uh, narrow on the screen. You can see this little spike here represents this SOX3 gene over here um, on the right side of the screen. On the left side of the screen, you can see FGF13, uh, you can see that it's not expressed at all in this first cell line, and it is expressed in these other three cell lines. The uh, exon-only mode uh, is a nice way to look at expression data because your gene expression data is going to be confined to the exons, and the rest of the genome is pretty much irrelevant to you uh, in that context. So if we go to view multi-region, we're uh, faced with a, uh, a checkbox here that allows us to uh, go into multiple different types of multi-region view. But for now, let's simply click show exons using UCSC genes. And you can see here's where you change the padding, where you have a little bit of uh, intron uh, nearby. I'll just accept the default here. It puts six bases on either side of uh, uh, exons, giving you a little 12 base uh, space between adjacent exons. So hitting submit here, the uh, browser will take a few seconds. It's dividing the screen up into vertical slices where each exon is in its own slice and it's thrown away all of the introns. Uh, you can see here that we've drawn uh, the virtual chromosome that's been created uh, from this is 27 kilobases in size and it, expand, it still uh, spans the, 20, uh, the two megabases that we had on the screen before but each one of these little pink lines in here represents a missing uh, piece of DNA, be it an intron or a, uh, uh, an intervening uh, region between, uh, between genes, an intergenic region. You can see that some of uh, the uh, little 12 base spaces are here, uh, this little white space or little thin white lines on the, uh, on the browser. Um, it's actually an engineering tour de force. Our engineer, Galt Barber, uh, did this, uh, and he made extensive use of some, of some pretty clever programming. And one feature I didn't show you yesterday is the ability to rearrange tracks uh, in the vertical dimension. And so what Galt's done here is he sliced the screen up into many little pieces, and yet it's still possible to rearrange tracks if you situate your mouse over the left side of the screen here. Uh, you get this up, up down, double-headed arrow there, indicating that you have the option to uh, uh, move your tracks around. You can uh, uh, slide them up and down. So he's maintained that capability uh, in the Exxon only mode here. So one interesting thing you find when you go to Exxon only mode at this particular region is that there's an exon here that's uh, much larger than the exon in these other isoforms of FGF13. And uh, interestingly, you can see here that the, um, the blue and the green, I'll slide all of the blues together, the cell, cell lines that are in blue and green, are all transcribed uh, off the same strand of DNA, uh, but the blue cell line is using these exons over here, and the green is using this other exon over here, uh, which is a feature that's uh, completely uh, uh, impossible to recognize when you're zoomed out at the two uh, megabase uh, range. 
Um, this is where I usually remember to show the uh, keyboard shortcuts, which I don't use very much myself because I'm quite familiar with where all the pull down menus are. And it's a relatively recent feature uh, engineered by Max Heusler. But on my keyboard, I'm with my mouse just somewhere on the page here, I'm simply going to type a question mark, which will open up the menu showing you the options for keyboard shortcuts. If there are things that you do frequently, uh, the keyboard shortcuts are a quick way to get there. Um, I do load custom tracks from time to time, and I even remember that CT means custom tracks, and I occasionally remember to do it, uh, do that. But um, the default view uh, is a quick way to get out of Exxon only mode so that I can type DV on my keyboard, and it will uh, immediately pop back out of Exxon only mode. Um, one thing I probably should have shown you, um, let's see if there's an Exxon only, okay, EV is Exxon only view. So I go to EV, redraw the screen in Exxon uh, view. And uh, I failed to show you that uh, this is an active session. You've actually pulled down uh, the, uh, the genome into uh, just its Exxons, but the uh, other features such as dragging the screen to the right or the left, if I put my mouse over there, uh, it will um, kind of cache the data that it already has for the part of the uh, screen that's still showing, and then it'll redraw in Exxon only mode uh, any genes that are off the screen here. So we're still at the same resolution. We're still at 27 base pairs. And you can zoom in and out if you, if you want to look at just this one region here. You can zoom into that region in Exxon only mode and it shows you which regions are being stitched together. So the full functionality of the browser is still there, even though you've sliced it into Exxon only mode. So let's go back to default view by typing DV again here. And now it'll take that region that you're looking at and uh, put it back into default view. So let's go now to um, load some custom tracks onto the genome browser. And first let's uh, collapse this particular track set. Put my, I put my mouse over the uh, little bar on the left side and uh, I use the right mouse button to pull up the context sensitive menu and uh, hide the track set by clicking uh, on that particular selection. So we have the genes track uh, left on here. And so let's flip back to our index page here and click into uh, ctexamples.txt. So this page has a number of different blocks of text separated by a white, uh, white space, a white line. Uh, and each one of them represents a small bit of data in a different format. So it's possible then to uh, put your mouse over here and uh, uh, copy the whole page. So uh, on my machine, it's control A followed by control C. You can also copy the URL up here. And I'll show you that me uh, method here. Uh, copy that. So whichever you choose to do, you're grabbing either the data or the URL, which is a pointer to the data. And then you can go back to the browser here and you can load my data custom tracks. This is a good time to point out that a number of the items in the pull down menus are also available at the bottom of the screen here using um, these buttons. For example, add custom tracks takes you to the same place as the pull down menu I just showed you. So if you click the button, add custom tracks, our custom tracks input page is available to you. And I will simply paste the URL. Uh, you can also just paste the data and then hit submit. Uh, the result is loading all of the data from that page. And it will take us to a, uh, a page that has um, a, sub, uh, a table with one line per custom track. So before we actually click into the browser, I want to point out that uh, when you load your own custom track, you have control over the long label, which is called description here. And it's the same as the label that appears in the browser graphic when the uh, data uh, are represented uh, in, the gra in the graphic. It disappears when it's in hide mode. And then name over here is also what we call the short label, and it's the label over the track controls down at the bottom of the graphic. And when we get to the, back to the browser, uh, I'll show you that. So here's the position box. 
in the position box, the, uh, the data uh, can be loaded uh, using the very first item in the track. So if we click uh, position here on chromosome six, while it's loading, I'll go back to the track here and I'll show you how it's encoded. So track name equals and description equals. I can show you here um, where is the, yeah, the, uh, the paired ends track is the one I highlighted before. And you, you define it simply by in the header, the word track followed by a number of key equals value uh, items. And then the visibility, whether the track will be on or not, and how it's on is present, uh, is uh, encoded this way. Uh, visibility equals pack. So here we are at the browser. The first item in the first track is item zero. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was designed for this demonstration to simply encompass the entire space uh, for which there are data in any one of those uh, tracks. So the... Um, the different items here in this track are in a bit, uh, what we call bed uh, four format. It's nearly the very simplest format because uh, you can do without the name and still get a track. So Chrome, Chrome Start, and Chrome End are the minimal uh, items needed to show you uh, a box on the browser. And bed means browser extensible display, and it's a format that simply lets us draw br uh, a browser um, item on the track on the uh, on the screen. Uh, the next track here is uh, bed 12, which lets you draw a gene model where you can connect things. And a more practical example these days, uh, since most of our users are not creating gene models themselves, although you might if you were working on another organism that hasn't been well annotated, uh, or if you were doing your own assembly hub. Uh, bed 12 format can also be put into service for paired end sequencing, where you have a couple of reads at the end of the same molecule and you want to represent how those molecules are, um, are displayed. And you can see how your, uh, your uh, sequencing looks, how, how much of the uh, ends you've sequenced, and how well um, aligned they are to the genome. It's also a way to pick out uh, insertions and deletions. If your sample has a deletion relative to the reference, then the two ends will seem closer together on the reference than they actually are in your sample. And so those... Uh, um, two reads on the opposite ends will not be the same distance apart as most of the reads in your sample. And so bed 12 format here has been adopted to uh, in service of the, the paired ends. And you can see here that uh, one of the uh, items is item RGB, one of the columns, and that's red, green, and blue. So I chose a little bit of a red color for the negative strand. You can see here that some of the uh, fields were are just filled in with zeros. And uh, those are the fields that are used to show um, the uh, the ends of the uh, of the gene uh, gene annotation. And then black, this RGB color space is available on the web. You can pick out any color you like uh, and put them in there for individual items. So if I flip back to the browser here, you can see that this this is a bed 12 format, but several of the uh, fields are uh, are empty. All of our uh, custom track formats are um, you know, pretty well documented. And so if you go to my data uh, custom tracks, you can also search via help, but the most direct way is to just go to um, the add custom tracks page. And from the add custom tracks page, there's a, uh, a listing of all of the different data formats that are uh, available uh, in the wiggle and big wig and so forth have a number of parameters that are not in any of the files I'm showing you today, but you can get fairly fancy with the way you do your display uh, if you go in there and you look at your uh, the details of how, what kind of configuration options are available. You just string them together on the command line here uh, in the, uh, the header, uh, in the track uh, header, and then they uh, are applied to your track. So going back to the browser now using just the link here in the blue bar uh, genome browser, we can take a look at the next track down, which is a bed graph track. So you can load your data into uh, a bed graph format using um, simply a fourth data column here, um, which is very similar to the bed four format, except that it needs to be a value and the browser needs to know that you're using a bed uh, graph format. And so you have to put, uh, I'm sorry, you have to put type equals bed graph in your header. 
without that, these values will simply be interpreted as labels and you'll get little boxes without any second dimension. And um, the boxes will have a label next to them, which will be your number. So if you go back here, you can see that you've got the interval identified and the height of the box. So the first two items are 50 and 100. And you can see here that the first two items are um, relative to each other, double uh, in this case relative to the other one. And the, uh, the value is uh, available in the, uh, uh, the left side of the bar. These tracks, like all of our tracks, are configurable if you click into the little bar on the left side there. And a bed graph file uh, will let you, uh, for example, you can double the size of the track simply by doubling the number of pixels you're displaying. And you can chop it off. You can, whoops, track height is invalid. Let's, let's put this one to uh, maximum value of uh, 60 here. So it'll chop that off. Uh, I don't understand why it's only one to 11 to 70. That might be something that um, we can ask as a question to Lou and see if he can dig that out while we're working. If not, we'll try to post the answer somewhere. Uh, so if I hit submit, then you can see that the track height uh, is set at 70. And any peak that's taller than that will have a little pink hat on the top of it to indicate there's data uh, missing from uh, the display, that there's more to be seen off screen. So bed graph is a little bit of a uh, kind of a greedy format, if you will, that it takes a lot of data to represent it where you have some very large uh, numbers. Uh, there's a form called Wiggle, which lets you show your data in a much uh, more compressed format, uh, but it has a few constraints. So let's go take a look at Wiggle, which is then tracked down. And uh, you can see here that we've dispensed with the CHR6. Uh, we no longer have chromosome for each value. You can see how your data set will get really large if you use every, uh, if you have a value at every base, you have 3 billion items and you have many, many, many repetitions of CHR6 to, to put uh, 100 million or, or however many uh, chromosome uh, bases there are in the chromosome. So the wiggle format lets you pull the chromosome value out of that first column and just write it once, chrome equals CHR6 shows up in the header and you dispense with the first column. Now, if your data are uniformly uh, spaced, in this case, um, I'm putting them at uh, every 10 bases, you can compute the second value from the first value. So you can throw away up to nine or uh, nine uh, characters of data plus the space uh, by simply throwing away the Chrome end and your data set is condensed down now into uh, Chrome start coordinate and a, uh, a value, that's the height, and the Chrome end coordinate is simply computed by adding the span. So if I go back here, you can see here's a, a, a track, a, a wiggle track. So that's the, uh, the preferred method of uh, displaying data from uh, that's continuously variable across the genome. And it can be condensed even further into a bigwig format, which is a binary format. And we have software for that, which you can uh, download and you can get instructions for how to do that from the uh, uh, the link that I showed you via the uh, the add custom tracks location in our in our documentation. Uh, the downside to that is for people who do not have easy access to a URL for loading uh, those browser, you need to find a place to put it, such as the Cyverse and uh, eventually the the Dropbox. The next data format down in the uh, custom track. Here is the PG SNP format, this personal genome SNPs, and it was developed by um, a colleague at Penn State, um, Belinda Giardine, and it was in service of loading uh, Watson and Crick and Venter and the individual genomes that we have on the browser. We've put it into use as well for the uh, data annotation integrator, which uh, I want to show you next. But I do want to show you here that the mouse over on uh, any one of these items um, tells you the, uh, the ratio of the two items. So if there's a, uh, a reference uh, allele and a non-reference allele, uh, and you've done uh, some uh, whole exome sequencing, you may get 30 reads of G and 60 reads of A. You can put it into this file, and so you can see at a glance what your coverage is of the two alleles, or whether it's a, a heterozygote or a homozygote. Uh, in addition, um, 
you can you can load the data into the variant annotation integrator. Uh, here's the data format. It's a modified bed file. The name here has to show the two alleles. Uh, the number of alleles has to be shown. And um, although actually the number of alleles can be zero, and then over here you have to have zeros in these columns. If you have three alleles, then the number will be three, and then your uh, read depth can be shown up here in this uh, uh, allele frequency column here. Uh, here was the 6090 that we saw earlier, and you have to have a common delimited uh, um, data field here that matches the, the number in the, uh, the data field next to it. If you want to just load the data into the variant annotation integrator, you have the option of simply uh, having zeros uh, in the file right there. So I want to go now to the variant annotation integrator and show you how this file can be used as input, and we'll get a brief look at the small amount of data here uh, and how the output uh, will be displayed. Uh, the variant annotation integrator is available for any data um, assembly, any genome assembly that we have for which there's a, uh, a gene set. So the tools, variant annotation integrator here, can be used um, then to, to look at data from any track that's in a proper format. The uh, formats that are supported by uh, this tool are the PG SNP format and uh, VCF format. Uh, we have some artificial examples here that you can see uh, that you can load into the browser. If you come here without any tracks uh, loaded, then uh, you can still play with it a little bit using the uh, those uh, uh, artificial examples. You can also load variants in as HGVS or RSIDs, variant identifiers, and so you can see what the variants are. If they have an RSID in dbSNP, you can load them in uh, in a in a, uh, in a file or paste them in there. So the file that we just loaded, uh, this custom track, is my data, uh, my SNP custom track, and that comes from the long label here that uh, description equals uh, personal genome SNP format. So um, right now I'm simply going to take the defaults, but I'm going to point out that there are a number of different uh, uh, things you can do to uh, configure this, including if you don't like the UCSC genes track, you prefer RefSeq or um, one of the other gene sets, we have a large number of gene sets that you can use, and those gene sets will then be used to annotate the, uh, the output. Uh, I will show you briefly that if you use the NCBI RefSeq curated track, you can jump uh, down here to one of the uh, output formats, and the HGVS uh, variant nomenclature, you can get your output in HGVS in both the uh, C dot or the P dot uh, nomenclature. Um, the G dot is a little bit weird because you already typically already have your input coordinates so that this will simply output your coordinates uh, back to you. It's a little bit circular. So I'm not going to use HDVS output and I'm going to scroll back to the top of the page and uh, select the gene set, uh, the default gene set, UCSC genes here. And I'm going to scroll down and show you some of the other things. You can get intersections with transcription factors if you believe that a transcription factor uh, a variant in a transcription factor is significant or relevant to your work. You can turn that on and it will pull out the uh, uh, intersections with uh, the transcription factor. Scrolling up a little bit, DNA hypersensitivity data are available there. Uh, if you're in a tissue that uh, you can see whether or not the DNA is open uh, for transcription in various tissues using uh, that data set. The default outputs are SIFT and polyfen although there are others here, and we intend to include uh, Ravel and um, uh, CAD, C-A-D-D, uh, because we're seeing those data sets being used in uh, uh, slides at meetings. We try to be sensitive to our user community, which includes you. If you uh, find something that you would like included in the genome browser, drop us a line. Uh, you can reach us uh, via our mailing list, which I don't use very often. Uh, under help here, here's the mailing list under the help pull down menu. You can drop us a line and say, I really wish you had this data set or this output format for uh, mutation predictors or variant predictors and so forth. Or if you have a good idea for a display format change or something like that, uh, places where you'd like to see color, um, then just let us know. For example, we've been hearing from a number of people that they'd like to see color uh, or have color configurability in our data tracks where you might be able to select an item and color it or select a data set and change its color. 
uh, so that's on our, uh, our very long to-do list. So with uh, no further ado, uh, well, one more ado, let's change the output format to HTML because if we're going directly to the screen, it'll be easier to read. A tab separated uh, output is great if you're loading it into a spreadsheet or into a, uh, a uh, Unix pipeline or something like that, but it makes it pretty hard to read on a, uh, on a screen. So we do understand that we're not going to make clinical decisions based on this, that it's research uh, use only. And then here's our output. Uh, one of the first things you may notice is that this particular location shows up in multiple rows of this table. And that's because we give you output for every isoform of the gene. Uh, if a, uh, a variant is in an intron in one isoform and an exon in another isoform, you're going to want to know that. Uh, and so we don't want to uh, just pick one and give it to you and uh, mislead you into thinking that that's, it's always intronic, where it, when for in, in truth, it's actually also exonic. So uh, this particular one is an upstream gene variant. If you scroll to the right, uh, you can see that it's uh, 1,600 bases away from that gene, and it's to the five prime end of the gene, and the gene name is giving, given you right here, uh, LY6G6C. The gene that we had on our screen is uh, chromosome 6 open reading frame 25, and we were very close to it in our first variant there. We're nine bases away, and we're, uh, you can see here that we're upstream from it. Perhaps more interesting is uh, a variant that's in a coding region. And you can see here that it's at the third codon. It's a valine to alanine change by changing the middle amino, I'm sorry, the middle nucleotide, which uh, is number eight, because that uh, codon will be seven, eight, and nine. Uh, it's the 48th nucleotide in the cDNA, uh, telling us that we had 40 bases of untranslated uh, uh, RNA in the transcript. The output here gives us in SIFT and polyfin, and the key to this output, we have D for damaging from SIFT and B for benign from, for polyfin, which is uh, actually more interesting than you might think because you want to know uh, if they don't agree so that you can use some of your own thinking about uh, how these algorithms might differ. Up here at the top of the page is a, uh, an explanation of what the characters mean. Here you can see that D means damaging and B means benign in, uh, in polyfin. So you have a number of different uh, uh, outputs and each one of them then is explained in the header up there at the top. We use this uh, sequence ontology output. Uh, we have synced up with our colleagues at uh, uh, EBI on the ensemble project. So we're using the same output format that they developed for their variant effect predictor so that we don't uh, generate a new uh, output format because uh, nobody needs new formats if we can help it. We already have enough format converters without having to add to the problem by making a new format. Okay, so I want to um, go back now to the browser, but actually let's go back using a session. We'll jump straight to my sessions and uh, we'll kind of abandon everything that we have on this page. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mention it, but down below on this page, we actually have some splice variants and a number of other types of uh, consequence that might come out of uh, such a uh, such an experiment. So I want to go to a multi-region discontinuous uh, feature, which was mentioned on an earlier slide. And to do that, I want to let's see. Maybe I don't want to go to a session. Let's let's go. Um, Okay, let's go back to the browser. We'll go to Tools, Table Browser. And I want to load into the Table Browser a number of genes. And these uh, genes will be used as input for the uh, feature of discontinuous uh, display. You remember in Exxon only mode, we looked at regions that were next to each other, but we just threw out some slices and squeezed the thing back together again. So let's go in the table browser here to group genes and gene predictions. And the default is UCSC genes, so we'll accept the default. And then we go to paste list here because I want to load in a number of different genes. And I want to get the coordinates for the genes. But before I do that, I don't want to go uh, use the known gene table 
because the known gene table will give us coordinates for every isoform. And we don't really want four or five copies of the same set of coordinates to paste into the uh, multi-region mode. So to, uh, to get just a single um, set of coordinates for each gene, let's go down in the table uh, list here uh, to the known canonical table. But while the pull down menu is open, I wanna point out these other tables. These other tables are the tables that generate the content on the known gene details page that I clicked into yesterday. You may remember I clicked into SOD1 and we jumped from there to uh, the Kyoto Encyclopedia uh, of Genes and Genomes. Those data, all the translation tables for those different types of formats, how we know what ensembles using for different transcripts and how we know uh, what the gen code uh, transcript is, is all uh, encoded in one of these tables or stored in one of these tables. Known canonical stores the coordinates for one isoform per gene. So if I uh, collect, select known canonical, I can now go to paste list and into the box that shows up here on this page, I can load a, uh, a list of genes. So I'm gonna choose FGF2 uh, and the scenario that I'm proposing here is you have a, uh, have a, uh, a gene and you're interested in maybe some of its potential receptors such as FGFR1, FGFR2, FGFR3, and FGFR4. So you might have your uh, RNA sequence data um, already loaded into a custom track, and you may be interested to know whether you have uh, in your various cell lines or your various tissues, what's the expression uh, pattern for each of these uh, genes, and you don't wanna jump back and forth around the genome. And I chose these not only because they're, they're, it's kind of a potential biological scenario you might uh, be interested in, but also because they reside on a number of different chromosomes. So let's submit this list and uh, make sure that the genome link is uh, selected because if the position button here is selected, then it will only look for the genes in the region that uh, was on the screen last time you were at the browser graphic. And in that case, none of these genes will be because we were at that uh, chromosome six uh, location. So now to get the actual coordinates, we wanna dump uh, just selected fields from the table. We wanna choose only the coordinates. So selected fields from primary and related tables in the output format pull down menu. And then the get output button will take us to a place where we can choose the fields we're interested in. So let's choose Chrome, Chrome Start, Chrome End. And down in the secondary table here, KG cross reference, let's grab the gene symbol so that we'll have the, uh, uh, the name of the genes right there uh, on our output. The gene symbol is not necessary for loading it into multi-region mode, but uh, it's useful for keeping track of what you've got here. So let's hit get output and we'll get a text file now. Uh-oh. Here's my empty, did I accidentally click? Let's go back to the table browser. I did, I accidentally clicked position. Didn't intend to demonstrate that, but there it is. You get an empty page if your position does not include the uh, locations for the items you've put in there. So now on this one, we hit get output and we should get a table now that uh, uh, is a text file that has the coordinates of our genes. You'll notice now that it's sorted by a Chrome name followed by a coordinate. If you want it back in the original format, you can re, uh, uh, reorder it when you're about ready to paste it. So let's just copy these coordinates. I'll flip back to the, whoops, no, I won't. I'll um, now go back one so that I can get forward navigation to the genome browser. And I'll scroll down to here and use the multi-region button below the browser graphic. You remember it's also in the um, pull-down menu uh, under uh, view at the top of the screen. So let's click the button here next to the text box and paste them in. And if we wanted them back in uh, original form, let's put FGF2 uh, itself. At the, we'll just paste it to the top here and show you how easy it is to rearrange them. Let's click 
Also, the square here, the little checkbox for highlight alternating regions in multi-region mode and uh, submit. And so we get a complaint at the top of the screen here. It says your new regions are not near the previous location. And it's going to give us the middle 10 kilobases of our new coordinates. So we knew that already, that chromosome 6 was not in our data set. So I'll just hit OK here. And let's also go and uh, turn off these tracks here uh, for um, these custom tracks, because we're no longer on chromosome 6. So if I click into uh, bed graph here, we can remove the custom track that way. Or we can move them, remove them all at once if we go to my data custom tracks, select that from the pull down menu, check all of the boxes here for our custom tracks and delete. So that throws them all away. And then we can go back to the genome browser now and the tracks are gone. Probably should have shown you before I did that, that we had an extra blue bar group that had the, um, the controls for our custom tracks right there so that you can change the configuration of, of them uh, just as well. So let's zoom out by a factor of 100. We go from 10 kilobases to 1,000 kilobases, or so you would think, except that it stops at 275 because we're on this virtual chromosome now that it's just our five genes. And so you can see that our five genes here are in alternating uh, white and blue background because we checked that box, that little highlight box uh, on the uh, multi-region uh, interface. Here's something I showed yesterday that I can show now again. The resize button will let me take that graphic and expand it to fill the size of the uh, window I have on my, uh, on my Firefox right here. So uh, multi-region mode then is a very handy way to look at uh, different regions of the genome. All of our data types are uh, displayed this way. The uh, RNA-seq data that you might have in your own custom track will be displayed here and you'll be able to see each of your genes and you see your expression data that way. Okay, so one more feature that was recently added, it was Brian Rainey uh, of our group, uh, spent a considerable amount of time taking uh, RNA-seq tracks and uh, making it possible to um, display them uh, on the same set of axes so that you can configure them jointly. Uh, a lot of people wrote in asking us to find a way to keep from having to do six or seven clicks per track when they had a dozen tracks displayed. And so it's called track collections and it's a way to essentially put them in a container so that you can configure them together. So going from my data, uh, my sessions, I want to simply load a session that has some such data uh, available. And I want to go down here to restore settings, username example again, and session name HG19 underscore collections. So if I hit submit here, um, okay, I do that about half the time. There's no S on collection, so HT19 underscore collection. Okay, so there we have it. I will leave it open for a second. HT19 underscore collection, username example again. And then when I hit browser, we're back to the genome browser with just two data sets turned on. So you may recognize them as two of the 16 we had on before. And I could have turned them off one by one and gotten down to this, but it's much simpler to make the, uh, the session and load it up for you uh, in one uh, single process. So let's go now to um, collections and we'll go to my data track collection builder in the pull down menu at the top of the screen. And what we're going to uh, create a container that lets us put these tracks into it. You're also, able to load um, multiple other uh, tracks into it and they're all configurable together. This process is limited to the uh, two-dimensional tracks in uh, Wiggle or BigWig format. Actually, it may not even be in Wiggle. It's a relatively new feature and I haven't tested that. So to start with, we add a collection by clicking this button on the right side of the, uh, the toolbar. And I'm simply going to accept all of the defaults here, but you can see how you can name the new collection uh, before you save it. So now we have an empty collection over here, 
and we can add these two tracks to it by clicking the green plus sign on the left side here where the visible tracks are. You may also recognize these names as being the titles of the blue bar uh, groups on the main browser graphic. And you could go in, for example, into the expression section and turn on a track and go poke around there and look for your data set. Uh, I usually find it more convenient to find my data set and display it, in which case it will be included in the visible track section at the top here. And so I know exactly what I'm getting. Once you've loaded your uh, tracks into the browser uh, collection here, you go up here to add collection and click the button. Whoops, I'm sorry. It gets me about half the time. Uh, the go button up here um, on the blue, uh, the blue button here is the way to load that collection into the browser. This is a relatively new feature and you can probably expect it to change a little bit in the, in the coming months and years while we get some of the, uh, the bugs out of it. For example, I'm an advocate of making the uh, go button easier to find up there because I do that about half the time, which means to me that it's not as intuitive as it might be. So we do have, uh, now we have these two tracks reproduced in, the sec in this uh, collection up here. And we also have the original copies down here. One of the first things you may notice is that the tracks don't look quite the same over here. And that's because the tracks are configured to full display mode so that the entire height of the track is visible rather than just the first 100 uh, points, uh, data points here uh, as they were configured in the original track. So uh, one of the beauties of having the collection is that they are co-configurable. So if I click into the, um, in the configuration button on the left side of the track here, I can, uh, let's make it a little taller to start with. Let's just make it 60 instead of uh, only 30. And you can see here that the maximum value is up to 1,000. And let's change data scaling from auto scale, which is what caused it to have each track uh, at full display mode for its individual track and use vertical viewing range setting. So you can see that the entire data set has data up to 200,000 data points. And uh, we certainly don't want to do that or our small uh, tracks in the 600 range will disappear. So let's just display uh, 200 of them. That will make the track uh, display uh, twice as much data as was in the original uh, track at the bottom of the screen, which was set to 100. So we have 200 uh, maximum value. We hit submit, and you can see that we'll have uh, formatted each track uh, now so that it's the same data here, uh, but it's now just in a track that's twice as high. So we have twice as much data displayed. Let's go back to the configuration page now and show you, show you merging tracks. We have a merge method called um, transparent, which will allow the tracks, uh, and it, you can do this with more than two tracks, and they are, it's called transparent overlay. And the tracks are now co-displayed on the same uh, axes, and you can see here that the green set is displayed by in green, whereas there's only a very tiny bit of orange, and you pretty much don't see it at the bottom of the screen here, or brown, whatever color that is. You can see here that the opposite is true for this one, where the brown is showing. And in this section over here, you can see that there are places where the, uh, the brown is taller than the, uh, the green, and so it shows up as a peak above the black peak. And so you can add multiple colors there and you can have them uh, add up so that whenever one peak is taller than the others, its color shows up above the others. And you can zoom around in the genome and look at different genes um, that way. You could also put it in multi-region mode and see your favorite genes uh, all displayed at the same time. So another configuration option here is if I click into this button, whoops, that's the wrong one. Okay, that's the uh, UCSC genes configuration button. Let's go back and redo that. And I see I'm nearly out of time so that I will click uh, into this collection here, go in there and simply switch it to subtract. And I'll change the vertical viewing range to uh, minus 200 so that if it's uh, negative value, uh, it will show below the zero and hit submit. And, uh, and now you can see that the blue ones are below the line and the orange ones are ab above the line there. 
and you can tell by that that it's subtracting uh, the bottom track from the top track. So if you subtract from zero, you get a negative value in the green area here. So um, we've run out of time in our allotted uh, slot here. And uh, I want to point you, uh, just for your own edification, you can go back to this page that we were sharing. Go back here. You can see that we have bar chart and uh, interact. And you can load them yourself into uh, uh, the genome browser into the uh, same place that we loaded the custom examples. Uh, but I do want to warn you that I uh, loaded into one of these two, I forget which one at the, at the moment, uh, a data parameter. I think it was the bar chart that says uh, DB equals in the header here, DB equals HG38. So that was designed so that when we loaded it in, it would uh, give you an error. And, and it's a way to confirm that you actually have your data displayed on the proper uh, um, assembly so that you don't load it into the wrong assembly by mistake. Uh, so with that, I will um, turn the, uh, the session back over to Jeff, and he can um, ask me some questions in real time here. Uh, I hear Lou's been typing over here fairly steadily so that I can tell that some questions have been coming in. Uh, Thank while, you. While and, I've been, uh, Yes, Emily has been doing a fantastic job fielding lots of questions that have come in. Um, we have a couple here that uh, I will just read out. Um, so a few participants have asked about specific examples of the bed graph and wiggle format. So could you just explain a little bit more about the actual data behind those formats, please? Okay, so the, uh, the, the bed graph format is about as simple as it looks. It's Chrome, Chrome start, Chrome end, and a value. And so to the minimal track for getting it in there would be track, uh, a word, just the word track, followed by type equals bed graph, that's required. And you don't even have to give it a name or a short label or a long label there. Um, I gave it a color, auto scale. Um, so the simplest thing would be just say track equals bed graph and the data. And so it'll give you a track that gives you uh, the range of data with a, a height to the peak. I'm sorry, what kind of data? I think you lose uh, Q and me over here. So what kind of data might you wanna put in this? Um, you may have um, a number of genes that you've looked at. Maybe you, you're accumulating data from a number of different patients and you want to just know, okay, how many uh, patients do I have that have had a, a, a variant in, you know, NF1 or something like that. So you could put the coordinates for NF1 and say, okay, I've got seven patients. So you have a seven there. So you could put the whole genome there. You could get a look at your entire data set as a summary uh, graphically, something like that. Um, uh, wiggle data and, uh, uh, are, is most commonly used to encode uh, the kind of data that varies over the whole genome, uh, such as the coverage of a, BAM, of a BAM file or RNA seq data, where you every base, you may have a coverage of an exon, but that it bounces around, that you don't have the same coverage on every base. And so you have a value at every nucleotide. And so in that case, you have a very large data set where you have a, uh, 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 a different value at every nucleotide. And if some exons are poorly covered, if you're doing an exon capture experiment, you can graphically view the whole, you know, your gene of interest. And you can say, oh, wow, check that one out. That one exon is really uh, not very well covered. Therefore, I have to be uh, suspicious of any variants I see in that region because I don't have... Uh, very good coverage. Uh, or it may give you information about isoforms. It may tell you that not all the cells in my sample are expressing the isoform for which that exon uh, has a low, uh, a low signal. So there are a number of different scenarios. Uh, um, if you use an antibody to pull some DNA out of the genome, um, then uh, the, uh, the coverage of that uh, uh, antibody, uh, that's what leads to some of the data tracks we have in the ENCODE project where we have um, uh, transcription factor binding sites and so forth. Uh, these tracks right here are in bigwig format, which are simply a binary compressed version of the uh, of the bed form. I'm sorry, the uh, the wiggle format. Thank you. 
Um, another question here is, can you quickly show us the NOM AD and RepSeq tracks slash data integration? I'm sorry, what did you say, but the NOM? Can you quickly and show the genome AD and um, RepSeq tracks data integration? Oh, Nomad. Yes, I'm sorry. Nomad, okay. sorry. <laughs> Pronunciation. Yeah, we like to pronounce it that way because that's actually a word, right? Uh, a Nomad. It's not spelled that way. But, uh, okay, yeah, so let's turn on Nomad to uh, pack. I think I did show that yesterday. And what was the other one? RefSeq? RefSeq, yes. Okay, sure. RefSeq is going to be up here in the gene and uh, gene predictions track. And We'll turn that on and then hit refresh. We'll turn them both on at once. Okay, so the Nomad track at this resolution doesn't uh, show because it's in that PG SNP format that we saw before. And it's uh, it's a very busy track. They have uh, 100,000 genomes or 100,000 exomes and tens of thousands of genomes. So let's zoom in to this one exon here. And um, the RefSeq track looks the same as the, uh, uh, the UCSC genes track, but let's uh, scroll down here first and uh, we'll look at the Nomad. So the Nomad track here, here's a good time to use um, highlighting. So let's highlight just this region uh, with these two exons in it. We'll put a single highlight in this light blue that'll take the, uh, uh, the default color here. So if I scroll down here, uh, Actually, here you can see that the uh, uh, exome variants are in the, uh, the the coding exon, the protein coding exon, but not in this untranslated uh, exon over here. But if I scroll down the page, you can see that these data are in the uh, uh, are from the uh, the genome variants, not just the exomes, so they're not confined to that narrow strip. And just like in the uh, track I showed you in the custom tracks, the uh, the uh, mouse over shows you the um, the values, they have 214, I'm sorry, 21,000 uh, Ts and one uh, C have been detected. And then if I click into it, it gives you some of the raw data uh, from the Nomad uh, uh, track itself and a link here to the Nomad database itself. So you can go directly to that. So you can see all of them at once. Um, and uh, I know that Nomad has a, a viewer of their own but the, uh, the value of having this turned on with the other data sets in the, uh, the genome browser uh, uh, is uh, a little bit of value added for you. So you can control down here, you can scroll down here, and you can see here that the East Asian females, 280, 00 uh, for the different uh, uh, alleles here. I'm not too familiar with the details of this page, so I won't attempt to describe it any, uh, uh, any more other than uh, to show you the page and that there's a link back to the original Nomad data set. So the RefSeq track, let's use the right mouse button here to turn this track off. And I'll turn the second uh, large track off as well because I wanna zoom out here. Um, let's just pick a place at random. I'll use the navigation up here in the chromosome ideogram to grab a chunk of three and a half kilobases. So I'm sorry, megabases. So there will be some, a number of genes in there and uh, you can see here that the RefSeq track uh, came on in uh, dense format, which just shows you the footprint of the gene, but it doesn't really show you the isoforms of, of the genes. So I will open that up. These two data sets don't uh, differ from each other very much. Uh, sometimes one has more isoforms than the other. Uh, sometimes um, there's some differences in the, um, the start codon or the, the five prime end, uh, how much of the untranslated region uh, uh, there is. Uh, yesterday, I clicked into one of the UCSC genes tracks. It's much more richly uh, annotated than the uh, uh, the RefSeq track. If I click into the RefSeq track here, and we'll see one of the items, uh, this particular gene here. And uh, while it's while we're waiting for it to load, I want to point out that there are actually some subtracks involved also. Um, this particular page does give you a, uh, an alignment between the RefSeq uh, and the, uh, the genome. They're not always identical. And uh, as usual, a link out to the, um, uh, the actual data at the uh, contributing uh, location, which in this case is uh, NCBI. Uh, all of our pages have a track description. I'm not sure I mentioned it, but all of our pages have a track description here. 
at the bottom of the uh, uh, the item when you click into an item or at the bottom of the configuration page when you click into that little bar on the left side. And if there are colors involved in the page, somewhere on this page it will describe uh, the tracks and what the colors mean. I don't see any colors on, on this track. So I think that that does it for my description of the uh, RefSeq. Well, oh, actually, let's let's do click into this uh, configuration page and see if there are multiple tracks. Yes, see there are. We have the RefSeq curated is the one that came on when we turned that on, but we also have a number of different other data sets. Uh, RefSeq all UCSC's mapping of RefSeq. We use a slightly different uh, mapping mapper. We use BLAST and they use BLAST, so we get slightly different uh, uh, mappings. Um, when we map it using BLAT. So another question, or we are, we have four minutes left, right? Yeah, we're, we're sort of out of time for questions, unfortunately. But um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll change presenters um, back to me and I'll just do a wrap up. Okay, before you do that, are, am I still on? Yes. Okay. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the browser with you. As I said earlier, I know I'm going pretty fast, um, but you can watch the video. Uh, you can also check out some of our other um, uh, our other resources, our help pages, and so forth. And uh, we do have a mailing list for you to uh, uh, write to. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bob, and also to Lou. That's been excellent. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is also accompanying practical sessions. Um, so as I said, if you are in Cairns, Townsville, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne or Adelaide, uh, please go along to our website. So that's embleabr.org.au slash about events, uh, and you'll see uh, links to those. Um, I do know that some of them are currently full and there's also a waiting list, so at UQ for instance, but please do add your name to the wait list um, and uh, it's good for us to know general um, uh, numbers of people wanting to do these courses so we can we can use that to um, uh, uh, plan future events. Um, okay. So as far as Amble ABR goes and our webinar series, our next webinar will be on the 30th of November. Um, this will be uh, delivered by Jason Williams from Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory in New York. And he is the Ad Education Outreach and Training Lead for the Cybers Data Management and Analysis System. So he's going to give us an overview of Cybers. So if you are interested in registering for that, uh, please go to our webinars page. Um, so that's embl-abr.org.au slash webinars um, and you'll see that this is there and there's a link uh, to be able to register for that. Finally, just before we leave, um, Embl ABR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne and ARDC would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. Uh, for these particular events, Embl ABR would, would like to thank Dominic Gorse very much He's at QFAB at our QSIP node, and he's initiated this series of UCSC browser training events and also enabled its delivery through securing funding through an AGTA small grant scheme. Uh, just before we leave, as, as, a, as it closes, there'll be a short survey. If you could take fill that out, that would be great. It only takes a minute to fill it in. So thanks again. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in the training event, accompanying training event. Um, so thanks and goodbye.